For all two people who don't know anything about Five Nights at Freddy's, in short, it is one of the most popular video game franchises in recent years. Series creator Scott Cawthon made numerous games that all failed until 2014 when he settled on the idea of Chuck E. Cheese animatronics haunted by the ghosts of murdered children. While the gameplay primarily consisted of you sitting in a room trying not to be jump-scared, the lore is what really immersed people with the mysteries around the dead children and who killed them and much more. The series became so popular it dethroned Slenderman and practically spawned its own genre of gaming, a la Dark Souls, catapulted numerous YouTube channels into superstardom, and has made Scott enough money to buy all of those YouTubers new pants to replace the ones they ruined. With soon-to-be 14 main games in the franchise, and currently double that in book media, frankly, I'm surprised they didn't make a movie sooner despite all the delays. Five Nights at Freddy's follows Mike Schmidt down on his luck after the Hunger Games since no other franchise took off for him, so he resorts to sleep meds while caring for his younger sister, Abby. After giving a father he mistook for a kidnapper the Shane Carwin treatment, he's desperate for work when a career counselor gives him a job offer as a night guard for the long-abandoned Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. As mentioned before, it is a stand-in for Chuck E. Cheese that used advanced animatronics and was shut down after multiple kids went missing and no such was caught. Mike is hesitant at first, but decides to take the job because his aunt wants custody of Abby so she can collect a weekly check to fund her insatiable consumption of box wine. However, Mike is haunted by his own past failure. When he was a kid, his brother was kidnapped and never seen again, which destroyed his family. So he takes enough sleeping meds to knock out an elephant in hopes of discovering hidden details in his dreams because he's too broke to hire Sean Spencer. While dreaming in the pizzeria, Mike crosses paths with a mysterious group of children and learns from a local police officer, Vanessa, the ghosts of these children control the animatronics. But something sinister is at play as they want Abby. So Mike must work to uncover what happened to these children in order to protect his sister. Based on that summary, if you're a FNAF nerd, you probably want to shove your head into an animatronic at this point, and I don't blame you. We'll come back to this a little later because the lore is its own issue. I want to cover the writing as it's most important, and this feels like a first draft. Some elements are good, like Mike's drive to save his sister and fix the past. How ironic that yet another child character witnesses a traumatic event and doesn't become a whiny bitch. Things are bad, sure, but he doesn't give up despite attempts at sabotage. However, he has the brain capacity of a lemon. It doesn't matter if Vanessa exposits the history of the pizzeria or her character does a complete 180, Mike asks fewer questions than the U.S. Census. The aunt is a waste of time as well. As a secondary antagonist, she has virtually nothing to do with the restaurant, which distracts from the main story. You could remove her entire subplot and nothing of value would be lost. Even the dream sequences, given the context, relate more to the mystery at hand. The only reason she exists is to lead into the one real horror scene. Yeah, if you wanted the horror game to translate to a horror movie, you're jump-scaring the wrong camera. Five Nights at Freddy's, for all its limitations and repetition, is a successful horror franchise, so for the movie to be so uneventful that Scooby-Doo would be bored to tears really tells you how badly the ball was missed here. There is one scene where the movie does what we paid to see, and it's over as quick as the flash in bed. Any other scare is a forced jump that makes no contextual sense, and 9 out of 10 times, it's Balloon Boy filling the role of a murder of crows. He's not even a foot tall or animate, so getting scared by him is as shameful as getting killed by the mummy in Symphony of the Night. Which, which I did. Okay, to be fair, I'm not really trying on stream, but you should join and hang out. Anyway, if the big scene wasn't over quick enough, it is followed up shortly after by a scene that deflates almost all tension the movie could have built when Mike, Abby, and Vanessa play with the animatronics and build a fort. I felt like a crash test dummy after that whiplash. One moment they're bloodthirsty machines, the next they're big dumb cuddle bugs. And this brings me to the lore. If you know FNAF, then you probably already have a headache at the mere mention of it. But for those who don't, the lore is more convoluted than the American legal system. This presents a minor challenge, as the lore is not really set in stone like other franchises. Nearly every installment adds something new to past moments or alters the interpretation of events and information people believed was definitively solved. This sends everyone on a mouth-foaming frenzy back into the franchise's media to comb over every possible detail detail, even down to the pixel, so they can try and conclude something new that most likely isn't even true. So, 
I can't tear it a new asshole like I did Castlevania Nocturne. What I can say is the movie is trying to be its own standalone story based on the games like the Silver Eyes novel was for the first four games, which sets the precedent so the argument of, but you always harp on accuracy, can be waived here. Think of Netflix's One Piece. It isn't completely accurate because it was intended to be a simplistic version that pleases longtime fans and new audiences, and also respects the fans, unlike Castlevania Nocturne. And the film achieves both of these goals. Fans will recognize various story elements from most of the games, while new audiences will get the gist of what's happening because it doesn't get complex with things like mind control discs and remnant. So on the lore and accuracy end, the film is basically correct, though I dread to see the theorists attempt to explain or fit in the death mask chair thing. Might end up seeing a massive increase in Advil and alcohol sales in the coming weeks. With all that out of the way, is there anything else you have to offer about the movie? Well, generally the acting sucks. I would say Josh Hutchinson took his character's abuse of sleeping meds a little too seriously if he wasn't like this in 90% of his career. He's got the charisma of a Magikarp and the energy to match. I don't know what meds he's supposed to be on, but I wouldn't be surprised if he dips his melatonin in NyQuil. Elizabeth Lail as Vanessa is hit or miss, switching between this will make my career to what the fuck am I even doing here? And Matthew Lillard is here and he's always a gem on screen. He's used about as well as he can be given how small his role is, but he is definitely one of the positives in the film. The cameos of Matt Patton, whoever Corey Kenshin is, are a big letdown. Matt Pat is a waiter who tries to scold Mike's aunt and his catchphrase is forced down our throats like William Afton stuffing a victim. Meanwhile, Corey is meant to be a funny and overreactive cab driver, and again, for me, the jokes just don't land. Besides that, everyone else in the film could have been replaced by well, animatronics, and frankly, that would be no different. Speaking of which, on this bright side of the movie, the effects are pretty damn good. Special effects are limited and generally kept in the shadows, lest they resemble one of the FNAF games, like the Cupcake, which attacks like a chihuahua after a line of coke. The practical effects are the best, though. The suits the actors use are great, and for much of the movie, I couldn't tell if they were completely puppets, which appears to be true for Foxy, or suits with mechanisms. The latter was the case, and they were whipped up by Stan Winston Studios, so they look and handle great in the movie. Besides that, there isn't much else to note, so ultimately Five Nights at Freddy's is a poorly paced and written slog of a film with mediocre acting, pretty good effects, and the lore is fairly accurate though with alterations and inaccuracies that we'll see a flood of videos in the coming weeks. Critics have already tried to dump on it, not that Rotten Tomatoes is trustworthy in the slightest, because it isn't woke, which is another positive in today's day and age, I suppose. Regardless, it's probably going to be one of the most profitable movies of the year because of brand recognition alone, and the opening weekend proves that with $150 million worldwide on a $50 million budget with production, marketing, and distribution included. So if you're a fan, you'll probably enjoy it, shy of a couple niggles here and there, otherwise you'll probably fall asleep like Biden when there aren't children to sniff. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.